afternoon. Uh, you were very happy to come to Mo Kuzi from SMP, and he's going to talk about the title, which you can all see. Quantitative stochastic homogenization and large scale regularity. So let me just comment that that basically uh, I think that that the that the order that I would have given basically the first lecture, sort of like, because I have a very colloquial style style uh, slides now. So essentially, I was kind of like just uh, planning to sort of like go very slowly and, and, and essentially introduce a bit of the mathematical theory, what we've been studying and, and basically the context. And of course, Antoine, Antoine Gloria, and Felix Otto, and the company, they've been basically studying very similar questions. And, and our beloved correctors, they also appeared in, in his talk. So, so what I'm planning to do well, Don't is... hesitate to go slow nonetheless. <laughs> OK. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I basically like that, that, that essentially this talk was carved in stone 2000 years ago. So, so I will just follow the slides and go slowly. <laughs> so so I, I had this temptation to, to go fast after Antoine's talk, but I will not. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will resist the temptation. You were given these precise instructions anyway, so it's not. Yes, perfect. exactly, exactly, exactly. So, so, so maybe Antoine is is blaming blaming Svitlana, and I'm uh, blaming Guy. So, <laughs> so we were ordered here. <laughs> Some. Oh, I'm, I'm blaming Guy too. Ah, okay, okay. So we are both blaming Guy. Yeah. Okay, that's that's fair. <laughs> so. I, I'll blame Guy too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. It's so new, you know. Normally, everybody's blaming Svitlana anyway. Okay, okay. <laughs> I just love the new order. Okay, okay. So we all blame Guy if this is boring to you. So <laughs> anyway, so okay, no, it's not working. No, it's working. So okay, so we have homogenization. I try to actually speak kind of slowly and, and, and nice. I have this new microphone, so I'm not completely used to it. So it might be a complete disaster. So if I shout and if it's if it's distorted please just say that, that something is wrong. Okay, so homogenization in this context means that, that we just take the simplest possible elliptic equation where actually the diffusion matrix A is having all the action. So the A of epsilon, oops. So now I try to use my iPad here. So that just means that we are somehow scaling the coefficient field with epsilon, and epsilon is thought to be very small. And as epsilon tends to zero, we homogenize to an effective equation. So to effective equation, is, it means that we have actually now constant coefficients, a bar, which is the diffusion matrix. And now, of course, the two basic questions are, so when can one expect homogenization? So this is the qualitative theory. And what is the rate of homogenization? And that's the quantitative theory. And essentially, the qualitative theory, this was more or less established in the 70s, 80s. And the quantitative theory, it's more like a product of 2010 to now. OK? So let me start with a simple example. I promise you that I will go slow. Oh, maybe I now take away that. that one like that so i want to be completely clear so to be clear means that i want to have uh, uh give you a formula okay so essentially i, I take this like very simplistic uh simplistic uh, example so i have a wire and essentially i have blue which is a good conductor and then i have some impurities in the conductor which is the red okay so there was certain law for it I had it essentially almost IID. The good conductor is where we have basically a constant one. And the red one is 100 times worse conductor. So we have basically one over 100. So this is the resistor. OK. And then we set the potential. So we put boundary value 0 on the left. And on the right, we will have 1. OK. So the equation then basically becomes as I wrote. 
So this is a 1D ODE. And of course, we can basically solve this one. We just integrate it from zero to X and, and use the boundary conditions and we can write the solution. So essentially we have this, this normalizing constant, which is just the integral of zero to one over one over a t over epsilon dt. So somehow the harmonic sum of the resistors is, is appearing. So this is where I always say that, that when you have this magical formula, one over R1 plus one over R2, this is where it makes it appearance. <laughs> so, so, and now the thing is that, that, that where we have kind of high energy density, so that is where the heat appears into the system. So you see, it's basically, it's kind of like that, that when we have the one over 100 region here, so essentially the solution wants to stay almost constant. Okay, and then all that, oops. Mm -hmm. And then all the action is actually happening, happening when, when we have the, uh, oh, sorry, it's want to stay constant when we basically have the, the, the high conductance and then it wants to jump when we have the low conductance. Okay, so now, and this is basically where you see the heat. This is happening in the resistors, right? So now what is homogenization? So here I basically insert more impurities, but they are kind of like less weighty, okay? And you see that, that what happens is that, that this starts to resemble just a line, right? And this is just 1D homogenization. 1D homogenization is saying that, that when I add and add, I don't know if you can actually see the red lines anymore. There are so many. So you will homogenize to the line, okay? So that's the very basic homogenization. And in 1D, we can basically write formulas for everything. So maybe that's, that's not a very interesting part of the theory. But anyway, this is a very good example to keep in mind. So, so I, I had some kind of like a random sampling of the impurities into my wire, and then I compute the corresponding solution. Okay. Now, uh, what about the coefficients in the higher dimension? So I will just kind of throw you in a couple of examples. So what do I mean? So these are the two most classical examples, maybe the checkerboard and, and then Poisson point process where I attach to each point, basically a small ball of size epsilon. Okay. So now you could, for example, think that in each black square, the conductance would be like nine. And in white, each white square, it would be one. Okay. And then the question is that, that, that when we take more and more these black and white cubes, we somehow flip the coin in each, each small cube. If it's, if it's tails, it's black. If it's heads, it's white. So we ask that, that what kind of basically large scale, large scale uh, phenomena we will find. Okay. And of course, the same thing here. So I would just basically put the, the, the nine to blacks and one to whites. Okay. Well, this could be also a bit more complicated. So this is something like I, I essentially take the white noise, I convolve it, and I truncate it away from zero, and, and I truncate it above. So when you see lots of red, you will basically put uh, put high conductance, and when you see blue, you will put low conductance. So that could be one model. Of course, completely artificial. So originally, why I got interested in it's basically I, I was studying a bit of physics when I was a child. I mean, child means between twenty and thirty. So 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 I come from a technical university in Finland and basically all the students start with, with kind of common curriculum. So you start basically reading physics and mathematics and then only in the very end you decide what you, what you want to do in the life. And I decided that maybe math is fun. Anyway, so I just took this, this kind of like, I would say almost random samples of some microscopic pictures, what I found from the, from the, from the, treasure mill of internet. <laughs> so basically, 
So, so what we have here, so the first two pictures are some kind of uh, samples of lithium ion batteries. So here you see some cracking. And now the question could be that, that, okay, so in the long run, when we actually have more and more cycles of the loads, you will see more cracking. So how is this actually going to affect the, the functionality of the, of the battery, for instance? Okay. So here is the same thing that the cracks are not that visible. And then this is basically some, some graphene foam, which is basically very, very uh, giving like a magnificent elastic properties for the material. Okay, so one could ask like that, well, elasticity is basically the, the system version of our question. So when you start bending, bending the material a bit, so you could still ask the homogenization question. Oh. I seem to have here kuva. So this is the Finnish lesson for you. Kuva means picture or figure. So in Finnish, remember that. <laughs> so, and then the fourth picture, it's just virus coding, which I found interesting because it was basically boosting somehow. So, so you coat with this virus, basically something like steel pans or something of industrial size, and you're able to to reduce the bubbling. So bubbling is kind of like when you're actually wanting to boil something, bubbling is the thing that you're fighting against because this is going to be an, an isolation for, for the heat conduction. So this viral coating basically removes somehow the, removes the, the, this, this, this uh, air layer from, from, from the boiling and it accelerates it by, by three. Kind of, kind of. So, so it's, it's really working super well. But these are, as I said, just random things that, that one could actually see that heat conductance, yes, this is basically our model. And uh, electromagnetism, yes, this is in our model. Elasticity, yes. Okay, but as said, we are just taking a look of the most simple things at the moment. So I want to kind of like just give, you, give a glance of the mathemat mathematical theory, what we have been developing yet, lately. Okay, so assumptions. So how we can track basically, basically these, uh, these properties of, of the materials, okay? So first we start with collecting all the symmetric matrices. So you can actually do the non-symmetric case as well, but, but let's concentrate the easy one, which is just symmetric matrices. Actually, this is pretty interesting that you can assume that A is just a scalar field. Okay, so we take symmetric matrices, and whose eigenvalues are between one and capital lambda. So lambda is just some given ellipticity ratio. Okay. So then what we do, we collect basically uh, the, the sigma algebra generated by these mappings A maps to A phi, and phi is just a compactly supported test function. Okay. So for example, now you could ask like that, oh, but are our solutions measurable? Oh, yes, they are, because you can actually approximate them by finite element methods. So this is, you can easily see that, that this is actually covering, covering nicely, nicely the, the, the measurability issues. And moreover, I always say this joke that, that measurability in this business, at least for me, this is something that my lawyer needs to know. So this is kind of like the beef is not in measurability issues. So, so everything is measurable, just take it for granted. This is basically, the important part is now that, that we basically assign a probability measure for, for, this, for the sigma algebra, okay? So let's go a bit back. Maybe this is like the most, the easiest example. So how, how would you do there? So of course you would ex uh, essentially take the product structure, right? So you would collect all the matrices, which is possible from, from this collection. So it's like, I don't know, maybe 64 times or 32 times 32 cubes. So that gives you basically uh, 2.64 or 2.32 squared uh, different combinations here. And you will each assign a probability for each one of those. Okay, so it's a bit heavy, right? So you don't want to actually compute all of the possibilities, right? 
So this is kind of like one reason that, that you want to actually go and say that, that maybe there is some uniform behavior that, that you can actually follow here, which is exactly the homogenization. So instead of going through all these, these cases, you want to actually do the homogenization and say that I just need to basically solve that one easy equation, which is essentially solving Laplacian. And Laplacian we can solve numerically, right? Okay, so my assumptions on P. So that's the data. So that's the data of my problem. Okay, so somebody gives it, gives, gives, gives it to us. Uh, Antoine likes to call basically these assumptions as sporty. <laughs> but yeah, I, I kind of like them. So you can do assumptions which are much, much more general and, and yeah, and, and this is basically summarized elsewhere. I just want to have like this simple possible assumption. So you have unit range dependence. Whenever two pieces, two subsets U and V are distance one away from each other, they are independent. So it means that you take a random variable depending on sigma algebra of, of, of or, or uh, constant coefficients in, in that U or V, they are independent. Okay, right? And then uh, the fir uh, this first one is basically saying stationarity. Okay, so if I go back to these pictures, so it could be something like that, that if I take a sample from here and I take a sample from there, of course they are different. But somehow that it's our, uh, our assumptions are saying that the law is the same. So when I move ZD steps, so I take four steps here, three steps down, and then the law is the same. And also these two pieces are independent because the distance, oops, sorry, I cannot draw there. <laughs> the distance is larger than one. So independent and stationary. So that would be the, that would be the, okay, sorry. That would be the assumption. And as said, so theory can handle much, much more general mixing conditions than this unit range dependence. Okay, do we have any questions at this point? So this is sort of like, I, I wanted to show you somehow pictures which are basically resampling these this ideas of assumptions. So you could sort of like, you could always keep in mind this, this, uh, this checkerboard example. So that's good enough. Okay. Now, the first naive thing would be, of course, to guess that that okay. So, so what is this this homogenized matrix A bar? This picture is actually here representing that that uh, it's actually not. You just you you simply cannot actually take somehow a sample here and basically compute what is the average of red. Uh, sorry, of of black and white. This has nothing to do with the situation. Why? Well, now you could actually think that, that you are uh, an innocent random walk, like Antoine soon after a couple of beers, so he will be walking there like, like a, no, okay, I'm not saying anything like this, zigzag, zigzag. Okay, so of course, the preferred direction is from up, uh, from down to up, right? So imagine that the black would be a much, much worse conductor now. So it's essentially like a wall for the random walk. So random walk starts walking here. Oh my, I found a wall. I need to go somewhere. Ooh. So you have to do much more zigzagging in order to find your way from left to right. Okay. So this means that the energy you have to spend from going from up to down versus from left to right, it's much larger to the, from left to right. Okay? Even if basically, so, so th there is kind of like somehow the geometry plays a huge, huge role that, that what we will see. 
Okay. All right, let me erase that one. And now, uh, so there are a couple of places where you can actually compute that, that what is the, what is the, the, the homogenized matrix. And one is basically this checkerboard. So I have here now, as I said, as I said before, so I will take nine, uh, coefficient nine in the black region and one in the white region, just the identity matrix otherwise. So now using uh, symmetries, you have so-called Dijkness formula and you can actually compute that, that your A bar is square root of nine. So the value here times one. So it's simply three ID. But again, it's not the, the, uh, the mean of the, of the two guys. Okay. And now I want to also point out that there is a very, so, okay, very small probability that, that all the uh, cubes are black. But this might nevertheless happen. So all the cubes can be white or all the cubes can be uh, black, right? And then, of course, the equation will reduce to Laplacian. So this is a one, one particular example of an equation that can appear here, right? So just keeping it in mind. I will come back to this later on. Right, so now, now I want to say that, that, that these correctors are actually playing a crucial role here. And well, first, they will give a formula, what is this A bar? So A bar, this is actually something that we saw already in, in Antoine's talk. So I have the formula that A bar is actually the expectation, and then I just integrate the flux of the corrector in the direction E. So the corrector equation, what it reads. So basically I pick up a direction from, from RD. So this, these correctors are completely linear with respect to these parameters E. So they are parameterized by directions, okay? With the next slide, I will basically give you sort of like an idea that, that what is this corrector doing? Kind of like a more, more geometric way to think about them. So we have the equation. So essentially we put in the slope E and, and then we correct it, okay? Now, if A would be just constant matrix, like Laplacian, okay? So then we would have basically entire solution, which is not growing too fast at infinity. Well, basically this is, this is saying the condition that, that what is it doing at infinity by the ergodic theorem. So essentially we would just see that, that phi E is identically zero. Right, so we could take it actually. So, so this is only, so at this point, we are only actually defining the gradient field, but we could, and in this case, take it simply, simply to be just the slope E. So this is kind of actually measuring that, that if regularity, in regularity theory, so for example, so, so you know that if you have an harmonic function, so the first, the zeroth order approximation is of course the constant, the first order approximation is the affines, and then you will have harmonic polynomials, right? Like Legendre polynomials or something, no, just harmonic polynomials, sorry. Um, and we would basically see that this would be the first order approximation in the case of the Laplacian, okay? So now, what do I want to say? Let's, let's see, let's take a look how these correctors look in this 1D example. So in the case of 1D, we cannot actually define them, them globally. But so this is kind of like that, how would somehow the local version, localized corrector look like? So essentially what we do, we just basically compare, compare this one to the line, which is the homogenized solution, so just X, and take away basically the rest. So this one would be the graph of the corrector in this case. So they are a bit more complicated in, in 
in higher D. So this is two dimensional case. Again, this is an approximation. So basically uh, here we have like 80 times 80 cell and we take basically Neumann boundary conditions. So they wrap around. So this is like a, an approximation on torus. But you see that, that you have like this, these mountain ranges. So traveling uh, to the orthogonal direction of the direction E1. Or here, mountain ranges to that, to that direction. So these correctors are basically, so one could of course want to have them basically completely local. So they would be some kind of like local thingy and, and not depending on anything. But now I want to actually mention one thing from the like bit more theoretical side of math, which is unique continuation. So unique continuation, if our coefficients A are Lipschitz continuous. So then if I change my coefficient field million light years away, I will basically change my solution here. Not very much. And of course, this is the, this is basically the challenge of the quantitative homogenization to say that if I change my coefficients far, 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 far away, so how much is my solution changing here? But it's changing. It's never the same. Because otherwise we would violate the, the unique continuation. Okay. Well, here you need some regularity from the coefficients, just to be said. Uh, okay. So now, uh, using these correctors, one can define this two scale expansion. Antoine was already talking about it. And so let me just give you a small picture here that, that what, what is this, what is this doing? Okay. So we basically have our function u bar. Oops. Where's this one? So we have u bar. Okay. And then basically, if everything would be sort of like nice and harmonic, okay, this is not satisfying any kind of maximum principle, but imagine that this is just a projection. I, I just take a line from, from 2D solution or something. Okay. So I will find here a basically supporting hyperplane. Okay. And it, it has a slope. Oh, let me draw a line. It looks better like that. So it has a supporting hyperplane. So now you see that that u bar is basically uh, so you will have a quadratic response or kind of like that, that that when you move away from that supporting hyperplane you are doing it quadratically. This is basically what Taylor theorem is saying. So now what is corrector doing? Well, essentially, what we will see so that's the u bar, so that's the slope, okay, and then we take the gradient of u bar at that point. So this is just x bar or x now, and we have the, 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 the slope. So basically the gradient there, okay? Now, for each direction of the gradient, we attach one corrector. So to E1, E2, and so forth. So what does it do? Actually, the heterogeneous guy will look something more like this. Oops. It's weakling, 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 weakling a lot. Because you have these tiny oscillations coming from the, from the coefficient field. So somehow you have to adjust basically, as we saw already in the, in the 1D case. 1D case is very special because we had only one direction. There is a maximum principle. But in the 2D case already you will see, see this kind of like up, ups and downs as where the pictures show. Right? So you have ups and you have downs. Okay? So what is the corrector doing? Corrector is essentially taking that slope and somehow saying that this, oops, somehow saying that this corrector is doing something uniform. So no matter what is the function u bar, I can take that slope and I take that corrector and essentially I can say that, that this two scale expansion is close by, close by uh, to the to the 
gradient of u epsilon, which is the solution to the heterogeneous problem. Okay, and oh, okay. So, so the thing is that uh, oh, sorry, Antoine is actually sending me some messages. I will I will answer the questions later. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. There is obviously a thing that 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 I'm I'm being a bit sloppy with the details here. So I'm just essentially kind of like you you can take dimension high enough. Let's take th three. Oh yeah. Okay. There is actually a footnote which is saying that that in two D there is a log correction. Anyway. So uh, so what what is it saying? So so one one would be of course very happy to prove some kind of H uh, one estimate. H1 estimates saying that, that the gradient of U bar is close to the gradient of U epsilon. But already from my picture, I try to emphasize that this is never possible, okay? Because what you're doing, you're sort of like H1 estimate is essentially trying to actually count in these ups and downs. So if I start taking the gradient, I will actually make basically O1 error if I don't basically have that, that some uniform correction to my, to my, to my function u bar. And this is the idea of, of, of the two scale expansion. You are somehow correcting with a universal function, any function so that it almost satisfies the equation. So that's the idea of the two scale expansion. And now one of the main goals is to then prove that, that, that you have somehow that u epsilon is close to u bar with a quantitative rate. But there is, there has to be basically a universal stochastic constant or random variable x. Okay, let me try to explain that why is this so. By the way, this is, this is why Zoom is fine, but I really don't like it because you're somehow kind of lacking the interaction. So I'm, I'm all, all of a sudden like, oh, here I'm alone in the in the middle of completely dark, dark department shouting alone in that, my phone. That's not true. We are following. <laughs> okay, yeah, good, 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 good. We're here. <laughs> okay, excellent, yeah. excellent. <laughs> there two special cases, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yes, okay, okay. But okay, I'm of course saying that, that you are completely allowed to sleep. It's after lunch, and, and if you feel sleep, it just go for it. I have this soothing voice now. <laughs> it's even after dinner. <laughs> okay. So, what I want to say here is that, that, that there was a small probability that, that all the cubes were black or white. Okay? So, Dyckness formula was giving us that, that, that A bar is three times identity. And and now I basically have that one, uh, one instance when basically all my coin stars were just heads in all, all of the small cubes, okay? So then my A is just nine times identity. So now let's basically take the solution to, well, basically our favorite function. So Laplacian of U is one. Well, I just put there the, the constant three, so which is the homogenized, homogenized matrix in this case. And of course, I can basically solve this explicitly. So I have this solution, which is like this, this paraboloid or concave paraboloid. And, and, and now from the formulas, we know that also u epsilon has this explicit form. It's just the three times basically u bar, right? Or sorry, one thirds of the u bar. So this means that u epsilon and u bar, they are very well far apart from each other. So there is some universal constant C of D so that they are away from each other. And now what I was saying in the last thing here that u epsilon minus u bar is less or equal than this, this random variable X times epsilon. Okay, oops. The message here is that that the probability in this case of the of the of the uh, random checkerboard 
that this random variable x is larger than one over epsilon, essentially constant over epsilon, this has a positive probability. Okay. So just to just to make it clear that 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 this is something, for example, which in the periodic homogenization, which is more like a deterministic style of homogenization, periodic, uh, almost periodic, quasi periodic, and so forth, these things don't happen. But here you're basically, you, you want to somehow give probabilistic statements. And this is one instance of those. Okay, so let me just say a couple of words about the background. So the qualitative theory, this was established in 80s by Pava Nikolaou, Varadian and Koslov and Jurenski. So essentially West and East were, were developing this, this independently or more or less independently. Okay, and then also Italian school entered in the 80s. So this is Dalmasso and Modica, and they basically develop a different proof, which is a kind of like genuinely nonlinear proof. And, and they use variational methods. And then later on, like, well, this is like 2010, uh, then, then Scott Armstrong and Charlie Smart basically started to, to, to develop this variational method further. Okay, in the stochastic setting. And and in the 1980s, basically, there was this large scale regularity results in the periodic homogenization by Avel, Avellaneda and Lin. And I think that Fang Hua was at least here a minute ago. Maybe. Let's check. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. Oh yes, his, his camera's off, but he's, he's okay, here. Yes, he's in yes, exactly. Okay, so so Fang Hua, hi, <laughs> and and yeah. So why I want to mention this quantitative large scale regularity because this is basically something that that we be, we have been developing then, then in the stochastic case. And now the quantitative theory of stochastic homogenization. This is kind of like. A, so, so in some sense, you can do the soft arguments pretty easily nowadays. So, so this is, well, depending on the assumptions, but, but this is maybe, maybe not the, the most difficult thing to do. Uh, so the first contributions, they were uh, by Nadav and Spencer. And, and essentially, they used this, this concentration inequalities, such as spectral gap or logarithmic Sobolev inequalities. So I, yeah, I think that in this paper, it's more like, more like a spectral gap. And ooh, now very so there is influential. Sorry, I is missing. Let me correct that immediately. So, so Antoine and and Felix Otto, and and many many co-authors of theirs. So they basically started to develop about ten years ago this this optimal quantitative bounds in the in the stochastic homogenization. So if you ask about the the checkerboard or or like like wide list of of examples so so their their results are essentially giving the giving the the, the optimal optimal rates in the stochastic uh, stochastic quantitative homogenizations and in the beginning the central tools were basically these concentration inequalities <laughs> and, yeah so i have antoine privately commenting me all the time so so <laughs> it's it's great and and then basically so there was this parallel approach which was basically then following this this uh, alternative approach of kind of like variational methods who originated by, uh, to dalmaso and morica or maybe the georgian so this is what the story says so so and and and, and there has been kind of like this line well, sort of like uh, Antoine, Felix, and, and then maybe, well, originating from, from the paper of, of Scott and Charlie. And then basically we have been continuing that one with, with Scott, Jean-Christophe Murat, and, and myself. And basically what we did just recently, so this came out last year. So there is this book, Quantitative Stochastic Homogenization and Large Scale Regularity. So you might see some resemblance to, to the title of this talk. So, <laughs> so, 
So that's kind of like, and now I, I just want to basically take somehow the chapters of this book and basically say that, that what, kind of, what kind of ingredients are involved in the theory? So w what kind of steps you need to actually take if you want to develop the theory? Okay, so, so this is basically the chapter one. What we do is basically, this is essentially the qualitative homogenization results. So you can essentially deduce the qualitative results from the chapter one, but we basically build uh, the, in the first two chapters this quantitative homogenization theory. So we do it with suboptimal rates, but almost optimal stochastic integrability. Okay, so what we are saying basically that as a function of epsilon, so you get algebraic rates. So there is some small alpha, but then the stochastic constant, for example, which is basically visible here. I will be a bit vague with this argument, but, but I'm basically saying that, that you get very, very good stochastic integrability, which is almost stemming somehow the, the case what I showed you before. That, oops, that you happen to throw all blacks or all whites. So there is always this one which is basically saying that there are crazy situations when no homogenization is happening, okay? But these have very, very, very tiny probability, such as here, okay? So essentially, the chapter two is doing this theory kind of uh, with the stochastic integrability stemming to that example, but with super bad rate. Okay, so then what we do next is this large scale regularity following Avellaneda Lin. So essentially, what we show, we show, so, so Antoine is basi was basically doing this, this kind of like higher order correctors in some sense. So essentially what we show here is that, that you also have like this higher order correctors and they are finite. So they are like almost like mapped one to one to harmonic polynomials. Okay, so you have finite dimensionality basically in your problem. Whenever you want to fix somehow, I will, I will show you the statement, but this is kind of like, it's very important. And these are always or very often called Liouville theorems. Okay. So then the next step is basically, now we take this large scale regularity and this uh, kind of suboptimal rates, and we are actually able to bootstrap somehow the rates to the correct ones, okay? So we will actually go somehow, we will, we will reach the scaling limits of these guys, and then we I will identify them to be somehow certain type of projections of the, of the GFFs to the gradients, okay? So you, you, you can actually show this one. And now having this one in hand, basically you have all optimal now, so then you can do the two scale analysis and have the right stochastic integrability and correct scalings in epsilon. And now the rest one is maybe this one, the chapter nine, so we will get basically that how you deduce from this two scale analysis, basically uh, optimal green function bounds. So you will have, you will have like a good expansion of the, of the green functions. And then there is a bit of nonlinear theory and also the non-symmetric case and, and the parabolic homogenization. Okay, let's see now. How much I have time? So it was one hour or 50 minutes or what was it? Uh, well, I am not sure, but I would say between five and 10 minutes. Five and 10 minutes. Okay, so, so then, yeah. Okay. A little late. Right. Uh, okay. So let me just basically say that, that this is very similar similar to, to the things that, that Antoine was actually talking. So I will just give you a kind of like a glimpse that, that what is this, this sublinear growth of correctors. So this is basically that you almost have the optimal integrability and, and, and crappy algebraic rate. So this means that I fix any number S between one and D. So S is D would somehow corresponding 
if that one, one would be a closed interval, that would somehow correspond to the case that, that it's all black or all white cubes. Okay, so D is somehow the borderline uh, exponential integrability uh, stemming to that. Okay, so I have a minimal scale. Okay, so minimal scale is that, that if I start taking radii which are larger than my minimal scale, then I know that the correctors are basically growing sublinearly. Okay, so sublinearly means that, that I have this parameter beta. So beta is strictly larger than uh, zero. So linear growth would be without this term. Okay, sublinear growth will means that that will mean that that I will win basically a bit of the linear growth. And what do I have? I have also that the gradients in H minus one norm. So this is kind of averaging the wiggles out and the flux seeds are also converging in H minus one. So H one minus one is basically just kind of, you can think that convolve bit with the heat, uh, with the heat kernel and, and integrate over time. So, so that's kind of like the smoothened version of the, you, 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 you simply get rid of the wiggles. So that's, that's what is H minus one. Okay. And now what is the optimal stochastic integrability? Well, this means that, this means that X is less or equal than OS of a theta. So this is kind of just coming from the, from the O notation. So this means that you have exponential integrability up to exponent, oops, sorry, up to exponent S, and you just take the positive side of that one. So you see, if S would be D, so I, I, was, I was giving you the 2D example, so that would be two. So kind of like, I would get the nearly Gaussian integrability here. So S is two is the Gaussian integrability, okay? And okay, this, so this is just by means of epsilon the, this part. Okay. And now I just want to say something I had in my title. I had the large scale regularity. Okay, I need to skip this part now. So what can one do with, with this, uh, this, this two scale expansion? One can show so-called harmonic approximation. So essentially, if I have a solution, homogeneous solution, well, to some boundary value problem or whatever problem, just local solution. So I will find a good approximation U bar for, for this, this U. For us mathematicians, this is, this is victory. We already know that, that our crazy function is approximated by something which is very, very nice. Okay. Now, how, what can we do with this information? Well, basically, we want to say that, that somehow this gives us a kind of like a good expansion of the solutions, okay? So I have two sets of solution, just basically this is meaning that I have a solution, solution set in set U and, and corresponding homogenized solutions. Now, I start putting some conditions in the infinity or at the infinity. So there is a certain growth rate for it, okay? So if K would be one, this would be like linear growth. K two, quadratic growth and so forth. So I'm just asking like, uh, so what are these guys? So classical Liouville type results for the harmonic function is that you will just basically get polynomials. So this is Liouville, uh, Liouville theorem for, for harmonic polynomials or harmonic functions. So now I want to say that the, that the theorem I want to show is basically uh, something similar for, for this, for this uh, heterogeneous solutions. So this means that, that if I have a certain growth, so if my solution is not growing faster than polynomial, uh, polynomial power k at infinity, then I can actually approximate it, approximate it with a polynomial, which is uh, a, a bar harmonic. So it's a kind of like nice harmonic polynomial, okay? And vice versa. So I will always find for every P, I will find this, this U, which is satisfying that. 
and this is already giving us that that somehow if I mod out kind of a k minus one, so the dimensions will match. So this will give us a canonical mapping between the set of polynomials, harmonic polynomials, and, and then these heterogeneous polynomials, as we can say. Moreover, the number three thing is saying that any solution, local solution, I'm just saying that we have a local solution in a ball BR. So that can be approximated super well by this, by this, uh, this heterogeneous polynomials. So you remember that, that when I was actually saying that, that the correctors are kind of like replacements of, of planes, hyperplanes or affine functions. Okay. So this was, this is essentially a one. Now this is saying that, that, that when we take our harmonic polynomials like that, so we can add wiggles to each one of those ones and we get a better approximation of the solution. So in some sense, this is kind of developing like a Taylor series. Taylor series of, of the solution. And, and just recently, um, maybe some of you noticed that, that with Charlie Smart and Scott Armstrong, we were some, somehow actually saying that you can basically pass K to infinity in this one. So you get kind of like a, somehow like a true Taylor series in some sense for, for a certain type of functions. So you can pass to the limit in this one, but this is in the periodic setting. Of course, this is a very interesting problem to do in the stochastic case, which is then very close to something like, I don't know, yeah, some, some deep questions. <laughs> anyway, I think that I have still like 75 slides. I was going too slow, but I will not bother you anymore with those ones. I will just go like that. Oh, this one I will show. So this is basically, <laughs> The GFF versus corrector. Mm -hmm. So gradient, yes. So, well, in the proof in chapter five, we proved that this is the same. And this was done independently by, by Antoine and Felix Otto as well. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm ready to take full blame for this. <laughs> one more, can, you, can you switch back to the to that picture of the GFF? Yes. So could you just tell us what what this what this statement means uh, that that these two these are literally the same or no 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 what, no, no. What, what of course of course I, I never can basically find find that that precise white noise which was actually giving me that so so. Uh, it's kind of like just basically saying that the statistically they look the same. <laughs> they, 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 yeah, they will. You can, you can actually prove that 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 in probability they converge. So they, they have the same law. In yeah, they have the same law exactly, exactly, and the converging law. Okay. Mm. Right. So the, there was many provocative pictures and, and and without proofs, but but this was supposed to be. More like a colloquial. If I could just add a comment, it's a jointly converging law. Sorry? It's a jointly converging law that's even slightly stronger. Yeah. Okay, that's that's better, yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yeah. Oh, I have a few questions. Okay. Good. Uh -huh. Uh, so first more remark about the sporty <coughs> assumption. So you know so this uh, finite range of dependence. Yes. I like to call them sporty. Yes, exactly, exactly. Didn't I uh, say that? I, I think that yeah, I mentioned Yes, you said sporty. that. You said that and yes. I wanted to explain why, uh, because I'm not a sporty guy. As <laughs> I know. But I like sporty assumptions like that. And the reason why I think they are, I find them sporty mm -hmm. is because they don't come with a sensitivity calculus. When we started mm -hmm. this homogenization thing with Felix, we were always differentiating with respect to the coefficient, right. coefficients to mm -hmm. understand how much the corrector was depending locally on the, yes. on the coefficient. With finite range of dependence, you don't have that. 
No. So which make it more difficult. So you have to mm -hmm. rely much more on the PDE. Right. But on the other hand, it's easier because the mixing condition is linear and you have a linear equation. Right. So essentially, right. when you make coverages of averages, it decays better. Mm -hmm. Whereas right. if you have a nonlinear mixing condition, that's not always true. Right, so right, 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 right. Thing. And, mm -hmm. I, and originally, the word, I used the word sporty because of the stochastic <laughs> integrability. The thing is, if you're only interested in scalings, Morally speaking, if you're a physicist, you give me uh, a coefficient field, I'm pretty sure to be able to prove that it satisfies a variance estimate or right, a functional right. inequality yes, in the form yes, or yes, the yes. other. Right. Because everything you will come up with is constructive, and as soon mm -hmm. as it's constructive, it satisfies yes. this kind of yes, 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 yes. I might even say that if you don't use the axiom of choice, you won't be able to construct anything <laughs> that I cannot. Okay, so, so that's a bit provocative, but that's a bit the, the spirit. <laughs> But the, 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 big, the big caveat in this uh, nonlinear mixing uh, business is the fact that you, it's hard to get this, the optimal stochastic integrability. And the only example that I know where you can prove nearly optimal stochastic integrability is finite range of dependence. Right. And, and right. then the, the, the limit, the sky is Gaussian. That's Gaussian yes. stochastic integrability. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So that, that's why I. I said it was sporty because mm -hmm. it was hard to get. Right, 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 right. right. Once my question related to that, what do you think is the best stochastic integrability? Because you definitely do not have it. I mean, you have nearly optimal in the sense that you have... Uh, I think that the Gaussian should be possible, but... Post, yeah. th that I don't think. I mean, that's uh -huh. just... Uh, I think okay, but, so there might be a... A log. So my, up yeah, now, there might be a log. is right. the power of a log. But I don't know mm. what's the optimal power. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So you, yeah. okay. So you don't think about it or <laughs> to go <laughs> race till the end. So, so what would be the, 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 the last stone on, on that? Right, 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 right. Yeah. So, okay, it, it's not completely uh, true that I'm never thinking about it, but let's put it this way. I'm not actively thinking about it. So this might be hard. So, yeah. Sporty. Oh, sport, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> we are sporty guys. I just came from playing badminton, so, so I'm a sporty guy. <laughs> I'm watching the US Open online, so I'm also a sports guy. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Drinking beer and, yeah. and watching US Open. <laughs> and so yeah, my that's... second question would be about the nonlinear case. Mm -hmm. So what's the status of uh, the nonlinear setting? Because this holds in, I mean... Uh, right, so... My, so... my aim is for mm -hmm. quadratic oh. stuff. I, I mean, for me, it's just... Uh, okay. yeah. Quadratic is an epsilon. This is, Maybe this it's is... hard to do and technical, but you can do it if... You, just right, 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 right. Considering uh, well, okay, a divergent, so, okay, but for uh, so, so, really so nonlinear guys, yeah. So in the in the sport case, I think that this is, I think that it's certainly doable. I mean, the quadratic uniformly convex, blah blah blah. So, 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 so oh. but a see, really nonlinear guy. Yeah, but you see, oh, you, you see, the, the point is that, that I think that. This is all already in the periodic setting. It's a bit, bit annoying. So somehow you, you have like, you can easily prove like homogenization, but, but then basically if you want to kind of like launch the machine, some, somehow you need, you need kind of like that, that somehow a good concept of convexity. And in the case of the P Laplacian, for example, so, so this is kind of given by this, this nonlinear function. It's kind of like nonlinear function of the gradient. So, so, uh, which is kind of like, th that, that's somehow the description of the convexity. And now uh, there are basically no proofs that, that, that this is somehow, uh, that, that, that the homogenized Lagrangian is actually having that, that, that kind of convexity. I think that there is no proof for that yet. No, I think so, it's not true. Yeah, I think so too. But you know, I'm 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 not that bold as you. I should be more bold. I'm also kind of like tending to think that that if I would try it, I would try to prove the counterexample. But now you can kind of like shift the the goalposts. You know, you can kind of say that okay, but what if I assume this one now? 
So, because homogenization is happening, we know by Dalmas and Modica. So, so that's for sure. So they, they, they did basically the, the P case, for example. So, so we are talking about P -la -plus, P -la, yeah, P -la -plus. yeah, yeah. So, so kind of like different sort of kind of energies which are sort of like not quadratics. Okay. So, yeah. But I, I don't know if this is really the most interesting quadratic or kind of like nonlinear, kind of like truly nonlinear energy to begin with. I'm not sure. Maybe I would do something oh, it's else. The, it's the way towards nonlinear elasticity. So I think, yes. Oh, yes, 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 in this sense, in this sense. But you know, I, I, I buried myself for, I don't know, 30 papers in P. Laplace. And I, 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 oh, honestly, I, I, did, I, I, I really do think that I did my part. <laughs> <laughs> or you, you're the best, the best person to do it. <laughs> I have a question. Uh... From yes. the uh, okay, uh, for this this is a uh, homogenization for operator like D grad. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that looks like this for uh, would like for eigenvalue problems and like for Schrodinger operators and then why you would apply this scheme to? Uh, okay, but, uh, at so, least so, at le, uh, in the low part of the spectrum, lower part of the yes. spectrum. Yes. So 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 so. Well, okay, so so this is something that we did in the periodic setting. Just okay, so 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 you can actually somehow use the Floquet block theory to to get the the lower part of the of the spectrum in the case of of periodic coefficients. And now Antoine is maybe the the one to answer about the 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 low part of the stochastic. I think that this is still completely open, right? Uh, the well, theory. the thing is. So I if mean, you have basically, so, okay, so let me write the equation. So that would be, I think that this is what we are talking about. So you have A epsilon nabla U epsilon is lambda U epsilon. And let's pose it in the whole RD. Well, well the thing example. is, if you had homogenization, you would have delocalization, so. Yes, yeah, yes, that, that's exactly. a bit the, uh, and, and I do right. believe that D grad behaves differently than minus Laplace and plus V at the bottom of the spectrum. Oh, and, yes, 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 yes. And for instance, using these correctors, you can mm -hmm. try to make some kind of, that's something I did. So yeah. some kind of proxy for block waves. Right. So block waves, that's essentially a, a plane wave modulated by a periodic function. Mm -hmm. And you choose the periodic function so that it's, so your plane where it starts the periodic function is an again val is an eigen function of your operator. Right. Uh, that's the way okay. you can do it by just, hand, right? And just to ask, because uh, a conventional wisdom that would be that for that at very low uh, eigenvalue, then uh, you know the, the the wavelength is very long, mm -hmm. and then uh, everything that the wave sees is like an average of the a yes. epsilon. Yes. Yes. And so that you replace mm -hmm. that. Uh, right, 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 right. So, okay. so, so, so my answer would be you cannot do that at the level, okay, I cannot do that at the level of the eigenvalue problem. But what I can do is look at uh, the time evolution. You take the wave equation, you take an initial data, which is like a very large mm -hmm. bump, and mm -hmm. you can quantify how, for how long this remains like a big bump. And that goes away. Mm. And then yeah, I so, so, can yeah, quantify be... this depending on dimension, depending on the time, and depending on the quantitative assumption of your coefficient, and that's very related to correctors. And so then the... using that, you can define approximate, approximate block waves. Mm. Right. Yeah, in the periodic setting, your intuition is completely correct. So. In the stochastic case, this is a bit more subtle. No, much more subtle. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. This was this was my this was my. Okay. So, you see the difference here. It's kind of Antoine is much. I say a bit. <laughs> You're too British. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning was exactly the same. <laughs> so we decide that the rest is for discussions. And we thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And so I guess
Uh, yeah, it's at the hour that we're resuming it, right? With questions and answers. Okay, so we have a okay. five minute break, like. Uh, yeah, uh, you seven, yeah. <laughs> Coffee. <laughs> uh, sorry, could anyone please re remind uh, me what we are discussing after the break? Uh, uh, we don't know yet. So after Question, the break, um, the general, uh, I, I, I think Lee maybe is directing it, so maybe he can make a comment. Uh, so after the break, there will be part of the extended QA session for the f for the two talks by, uh, let's see, uh, Professor Bonet Bandia and Professor Cousy. So I guess if you have additional questions after this, we can uh, keep on talking. So uh, yeah, cool. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And, and then after that, uh, Antoine Gloria right. also. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> we'll be around. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Time for a coffee. Yes. So we'll resume on the hour. <laughs> okay. Indeed. Bye.